God knows that your greatest need is to receive a holy hug from his very own heart to you. It's a surprise to most of us that God's greatest passion is not to give us a tongue lashing, but to embrace us with his everlasting arms. And I can prove it to you. In fact, I'm going to get you to read the same scripture that I will preach from this morning. It is Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 26 and 27. Will you read it in unison with me, please? There is none like our God, O Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, destroy. And so underneath are the everlasting arms. I want to talk to you today about the text that Moses pronounced as a blessing upon the nation of Israel just prior to his death. Think about that. Moses had one last chance to speak to the nation before he died, and he was determined to speak a word of blessing. Are you that kind of a Christian? Or are you a critic or a complainer? Or do you prefer to speak words of blessing like Moses did? When I grow up, <laughs> do you remember how Paul spoke about the, the goal of the Christian life is that we become a mature man? So I like to think about the fact that when I grow up, I want to be like Moses. I want to speak words of blessing to people in the name of Jehovah God. And his blessing in Deuteronomy chapter 33 was pronounced upon all of the tribes of Israel, but in the end, he spoke a word of blessing to the whole nation. And basically his word was the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arm. But notice how he begins. There is no God like our God. He is completely unique. I want to pause for a moment because I know that that statement is extremely problematic in today's world. Pluralism hates the concept that all ideas are not created equal. Some people want us to believe that every idea should be tr treated equally. But it really is misleading. Can you think about how dark the world would be if we succumb to the notion that one idea is equal with the other idea, all advances in the world, in medicine, in science, in astronomy, etc., etc., are because someone challenged the existing ideas. The problem with it, with this concept, though, is not only does pluralism hate it, but Christians misunderstand what we mean when we say there is no God like our God. There is no God as unique as our God. He stands alone. He rules over all other gods. That's exactly what the gospel says about Jesus Christ, does it not? Jesus said, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Can you tell this morning I'm taking some flu meds that are drying me out? So you have a dry preacher this morning. If his mouth dries out, it's because he's taking medications that hopefully keep the flu at bay so I can finish my sermon and go home. For those of you who are sitting in the front, I apologize if you get, uh, <laughs> if you get the flu. I'm just kidding. No, the flu is at my house. Where was I? Pluralism hates the concept of the uniqueness of God. Jesus said, I'm the door by me. If any man enters in, he shall be saved. Meaning, there are not many ways to God. There's only one way through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he offered at the cross. But Christians misunderstand what we mean. We're not saying that no one else has the right to practice their beliefs and their religion. Because in a democracy, we acknowledge, don't we, that we are all citizens of the same planet and as citizens of the same planet, we respect one another's right to choose their beliefs. But we will not acquiesce to the fact that Christianity is unique in its claim above all other religions. We don't apologize or give an inch with the truth that Christianity can squash other ideologies in its strength. 
And so we believe, just as Moses said to the nation of Israel, there is no God like our God. He's completely unique. Think about that for a moment. What we're saying and how that looks in your own life. It means that God is unique in his power. Do you remember how Isaiah took that idea and magnified it? Speaking for the Lord, he says in Isaiah chapter 40, to whom then will you compare me, says the Lord, that I should be like him. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. So Isaiah is saying just what Moses said. God is completely unique, but he's unique in his power because he is the one who created all things that exist today. He is the one who spoke and the world came into existence. We're living in an exciting day in that mankind is now able to see further into the universe than he's ever seen. It's a tremendous advance. But the further that mankind sees into the universe, the emptier he feels in his heart. But for the Christian, as we see far flung galaxies because of the Hubble telescope, our response is, glory to God. He is unique and powerful because he created it all. I'll talk with you more about that in a couple of minutes. So there is no God like our God. He's completely unique. Don't apologize for the supremacy and lordship of Jesus Christ nor of God our Father. Hold your head up high and remember that you represent the God who stands unique and alone in the universe. And you don't have to apologize for giving him your love and devotion because he's unique in his power and he's unique in his holiness. If there's one aspect of God's uniqueness that I think we've lost in most of our worship in our evangelical churches, I would say it is in His holiness, because He is unique in His holiness. That's what Samuel wrote in chapter 2, verse 2. He said, there is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. So God is unique in His absolute moral perfection. Who can argue with the fact that God has never sinned and could never sin? The Bible says that he is unique in his holiness. All of us here this morning would say there is none holy like the Lord. Let me hasten to remind you, though, that the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 16, you be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. As his representatives, we must learn to follow his example of moral behavior. Now hold on just a second. That scares me because I know full well that I have not attained absolute moral perfection and I never will this side of glory. But that's not the point. The point is that as long as I walk with this God as my Father, He has the right to continually adjust and transform and correct my behavior until I act like Him, think like Him, and behave like Him in all areas of my life. He's unique in His power. He's unique in His holiness. And I love this one. He's unique in His forgiveness. Do you remember in Mark chapter 2 when A crowd of people were gathered at the home where Jesus was, hearing him preach, and friends brought a man who was a paralytic, Mark chapter 2 says, but they couldn't get anywhere near Jesus, so they ripped the roof off the house and lowered the friend down, and Jesus, before healing him, said, son, your sins be forgiven you, and then he healed him. Do you remember that the Pharisees called him a blasphemer? He is blaspheming, they said. Who can forgive sins but God? And that was exactly Jesus' claim. When Jesus accepted the authority to forgive sins, he was claiming to be the unique God of the universe, Jehovah God. You still tracking with me, church family? Say we're tracking with you, Derek. Now let's go to the text that we read together and let me show you some observations that you can make from the passage about God's uniqueness. Let me show you, number one, that he is sovereign. You couldn't miss it when you were reading this passage. The text says that he rides through the heavens. It's no doubt a poetic term that was borrowed from the mythology of the day. Because Moses wanted to remind all of the people of Israel 
that God was unique in all of the gods of the world, but he was still the one who, who would ride on the power of the heavens. It's a poetic way, no doubt, of saying that he is sovereign. He is Lord above all. In practical application to us, it means that there are no mishaps or mistakes in our lives. You hear what I'm saying, church family? If we believe that God is sovereign and rules over all, we can't possibly see ourselves as hapless victims of life circumstances. We believe, as Ravi Zacharias said, that God is the grand weaver who is bringing all the different parts of our story together for our good and for his glory. Because he is sovereign, I don't need to live in fear in a world that is in chaos. I sure hope that you really are tracking with me because I'm showing you this morning how mighty, how great, how strong our God is because he rules over all. That's not just Moses' claim. It's also Paul's claim. In Romans chapter 11, in verse number 35, he says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul attributes to Jesus Christ the authority and sovereignty that God the Father claimed in his life uh, that Moses asserted as a ruler over the nation of Israel. So he's riding on the clouds, riding through the heavens as the leader of his people, as the shepherd of his people, as the sovereign God of our lives. I seldom stand on this platform without looking out at a diverse group of people, literally from all four corners of planet Earth. And my heart rejoices that the mighty God of the Bible is the one who found you where you were, drew, him to your, drew you to himself, opened your eyes to the reality of Christ, and showed you that all along he was ruling over the affairs of your life. That ought to bring a perfect peace, the peace of God that passes understanding. He is sovereign. Let me show you number two. Not only is he sovereign, but the, he is supportive. Notice what the text says. He rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies in his majesty. So God who is sovereign is also the one who is supportive in your daily life. Can you imagine? This strong God says, you call my name and I will come to your aid. I know what your need is and I will meet that need. That's the promise of this passage. So this strong God, this mighty God, this all-powerful great God Almighty says, you speak your need and I will come to your aid. I can't think of a more beautiful picture of the heart of God than the promise that when I'm in trouble, God shows up to support me, to aid me, to strengthen me. Do you hear what I'm saying, church family? David put it this way, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. What is he? He's the help of his people. He's the support of his people. He's the strength of his people. So we can say this morning with absolute assurance, whatever our need is, God is there to meet that need. But as you mature in faith, you also learn that your needs were not necessarily needs, but possibly greeds, and God will reduce your list of needs to the things that you really have to have. I say that because David wrote in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, if you don't mind me editing a little bit, that's all I want. I have no wants when God is the source and strength of my life. I do want to be perfectly clear though, God knows your need of a job. It's one of the most common prayer requests that we receive as pastors for this congregation. It's from people who are looking for a job or just lost their job, and they need a job. And we delight to pray for you in that need. And I can tell you on the authority of God's Word, the Heavenly Father knows what you have need of. Before you even ask, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, so if you have a need, you wait upon Him. 
What I can't promise you, though, is that he'll give you the exact job that you think you need. I've been amazed over the years at God's answers to my prayer, showing me that what I thought I needed were not exact, was not exactly what I needed. But lo and behold, he's always met my needs, and he will always meet your needs. How do I know that? I know that because Philippians chapter 4 says, but my God shall supply every need, your every need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And so he is a supportive God who comes to the aid of his people. The Bible says that he cups his hands over his ears when you cry out, and his ears are open to your cry. He heard you say, Father, I need your strength. Maybe your need today is to forgive someone, and you're finding that particularly difficult. The Bible says you ask God to help you in your need, and he'll give it to you. Think about that this morning. I have someone that has wounded me. I have someone that has caused great harm in my life. And I'm struggling with the stubbornness and self-righteousness of my own heart. And I can't overcome. My need is to be a forgiver and to forgive those who have trespassed against me. And when I say to the Father, I need you to change my heart, he does it, you see. Because he is the God who skips across the skies to find a place at your side to answer the need of your heart. So let me show you, he is unique. There's no one like our God, none at all. He is sovereign, he is supportive, and I want you to see thirdly, he is magnificent. Or we could say glorious. The text specifically says, he rides through the skies in his majesty. I wanna park on that for a moment. Because by and large, evangelicals miss the gift of God's creation, follow me carefully, as a demonstration of his glory in the universe. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And I would be the first to get in line and say, use your green bin. You know those great big monsters that the city of Mississauga dropped at your doorstep recently? Fill them up as a demonstration of being Uh, a steward of the environment, but not just to be a steward of the environment, but to be a steward of the glory of God. I've had the wonderful pleasure of standing in some breathtaking spots, very few as magnificent as standing on Corcovado in Rio de Janeiro, underneath the statue of Christ the Redeemer, looking across to Pan de Sucre, Sugarloaf Mountain, Looking behind me at the mountains and before me was the magnificent sea. And I was caused to worship God for his greatness and his power. I remember being in India, traveling through, the, staying in the city of Chennai with its teeming millions of people, which in itself was breathtaking. Some estimates are between 16 and 18 million people. And just outside the city of Chennai is the mountain called St. Thomas Mountain. I'll never forget what it was like to walk up that mountain, which was there, by the way, in honor of the disciple who traveled the greatest distance to give his life as a sacrifice for the gospel, Doubting Thomas, he's called. But as we walked up the mountain, the noise and the hustle and bustle of those teeming millions of people fell away to the quietness of St. Thomas Mountain. And I remember thinking, this is a, a view that I will rarely get to see in my life. We Canadians have nothing to apologize for because I assure you I've climbed up as far as I could on the Rocky Mountains out west. I put on my shorts one day and went running in the mountains thinking I'm going to get eaten by a mountain lion. And around every corner was a breathtaking view of the creation of God shouting his praise. And we need to learn to stop and enjoy the beauty that you need to get yourself a pair of hiking boots. And you need to get off out into the wilderness to hear the glory of God. Now, don't mistake what I'm saying. God doesn't dwell in trees. He doesn't exist in his creation. He is over his creation. And he is sustaining his creation. And he's controlling his 
creation. And when we see it, we bless God. I've tried to teach my family how to worship this way. When for all the years that they were growing up, now as they are all adults, about all to be married very soon, we try to rent a cottage up north uh, on a lake if possible and enjoy each other's company. There are 13 of us with five dogs. Now you know we're absolutely insane. But sometime during that week, We all make it a point to gather at the dock late into the night to lay on the dock with all of the blankets and look up at the falling stars. And this past year was perhaps one of the best of all. And as we lay there on the dock, splashing each other, threatening each other with dock spiders, etc., etc., my children got to see the glory of God with all the shooting stars that came uh, blazing across the sky. Are you teaching your children to see that creation shows God's handiwork and His majesty is displayed in the world that He has made? Of course, for Christians, though, it's all pointless unless we remember that one day we're going to stand in His very glorious presence and be transformed into the same glory by the image of Jesus Christ. And we await the day when Jesus Christ is said to have appeared on the clouds in all of his glory. We're waiting for him to appear. So he is sovereign. He is supportive. He is magnificent. And we are to enjoy him in his glorious creation. And and then lastly, let me just show you, fourthly and lastly, that he is relational. This verse describes God in perhaps the strongest and softest terms that you could imagine in all of the Bible. He is the everlasting God who has placed the everlasting arms underneath your life. What is he saying to us? This is a God who has a relationship with his people. Watch this in the text. I can show you. Let's just see, first of all, that he's described as the eternal God. That's intimidating, isn't it? He has no point of beginning. He is forever. He is eternal. Let me just remind you that Habakkuk the prophet said to the Lord, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. I don't know about you, but I'm not planning on dying. Oh, I'm planning very well that April may put me in a casket, stick my body six feet under, or throw my body to the ashes. It won't matter to me. Because I will be more alive than I've ever been before. For the Christian to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when we awaken in his presence, our mind can't conceive of the glory of seeing this great God. And what will overwhelm us the most is not his glory. Listen to me. It is not his glory that will overwhelm us. It will be his heart as our heavenly father that will melt us to worship. Bring us to tears. Change us forever. He's the eternal God who has been from everlasting to everlasting. But this text says, he is your dwelling place. I like living in Mississauga. And this is my home now. It's been for eight and a half years. I hope it will be till I retire my ministry at uh, 85 years of age. (laughs) Um, This is my home now. But every once in a while, I get lonely for New Brunswick. I think about Nouveau Brunswick, the, 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 wonderful, the wonderful images of, of the ocean, the vast forests. I was raised as a country boy, and so I, so I can still feel the call of home to New Brunswick, even though we've lived in Ontario and Indiana and Maine and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. We've been around, haven't we, a little bit? So if anyone is eligible to stand up here this morning and tell you that for all the places we've been, there is no place like the heart of God to rest in peace at home, that's Moses' point. The people of Israel would have their fair share of wanderings in the wilderness. They would be taken captive again and again by angry dictators, but their heart would always long for that perfect place of safety and rest, which is the heart of God. Do you see that? The eternal God is your dwelling place. There are two possible meanings for that word. One is refuge, the place that we go for protection when we're in trouble. 
The other, which has been translated in most modern translations, is dwelling place. It simply means your home. Every man's home is his palace, isn't it? Every woman's home is her castle. I get to go home and sit in the chair I want, eat the food I'm hungry for, take the TV controller and watch what I please, <laughs> because it's my home. Unless, of course, April wants. <laughs> We're, we're partners in all, in all of it. See, his point, though, just as you feel at home in your little palace on earth, your heart feels at home in the presence of God. And the struggle you have, the real struggle you're facing, is to see that he has accepted you through Christ and you are completely in, all in, in your safely home, in the heart of Almighty God, that's why Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many great mansions. My Father is Father of his family, and the home is where you belong. That's Jesus' point. The great longing of the heart of man is to find his eternal rest, and we find it in our God. So for all, wasn't it C.S. Lewis, Max, who said, the call of loneliness in every one of our hearts is a call for home. It's our longing for our real home. We get tired even of this life and of the things that happen to us here because we were not made to exist here eternally. We're made to exist in the very presence of God Almighty. Do you see the strongest, softest explanation of God in all the Bible? He is the eternal God and underneath are the everlasting arms. Now you know, of course, that that imagery of the strong arms that are wrapped around his people are met to elicit feelings of homeness, of belonging, and of acceptance. I've learned by just watching my reaction. When someone throws a ball my way, my immediate reaction is to block the potential danger that is coming at my life. When, when as a boy, someone would get into a fight and a guy would swing at you, you'd throw your arms up to block. That's exactly what God does with his everlasting arms when you're in trouble. He blocks the enemy's assault upon your life, and he protects you. I've also observed as an adult that if I'm standing near anybody who stumbles, the first thing I do is throw my arms out to catch them so there's no more harm done to their lives. That's exactly what God does with his everlasting arms. Because we have all stumbled, we may be in the midst of a stumble right now. And it is the people who have stumbled away that I'm particularly concerned about this morning. Do you realize that God does not step away? He steps towards you to catch you so that your life is not destroyed. There are all kinds of you sitting in this room this morning who are seeking to catch yourself in a stumble. I talked to a man in the first service. And he said, I've been away from Christ, and I'm trying to get my life back in order the way that he wants me to. And I was pleased to be able to preach this very message to him. See, I've often said, it's not how much a man or woman accomplishes in their life, it's how far they've come that matters. And if you're recovering from a stumble, you keep on recovering because underneath are the everlasting arms. But that's not my favorite image at all of the everlasting arms. Brendan, do you mind doing me a favor, buddy? Come on up here. I want to illustrate, and I'm going to illustrate with this young man because I've already done this in his life. Brendan, do you, the best thing to do with your arms is? Hug you. Oh, you got it. Did you hear that? Give me a big old hug. Can you, they, no, that wasn't very good. Give me oh. a good old squeeze hug. There you go. Show Brandon what a great hugger he is. You are, buddy. You've always given me a great hug. Thank you, buddy. From the first time I met this little guy, he would throw his arms around my waist and squeeze and say, I love you, Pastor Derek. That's exactly the image that God wants you to see about his everlasting arms that are underneath, that he has given you the acceptance that your heart craves. He's given you the home that your soul needs because he has wrapped his everlasting arms around your soul and said, you belong to me. So we've been thinking about the uniqueness of our God. There is none like him. But uh, I want to read you Moses' conclusion. Listen carefully. So what does it mean to us that our God is unique? He says in verse number 29, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you? 
a people saved by the Lord. You see, this message basically comes down to, if you really believe that he is the great and unique God of the universe, then he is demanding that you follow him in your own uniqueness. Here's what I'm saying. You are unique because of your proximity to the almighty God who is unique. You are unique because you have been elected by him. And because you have been elected by him, you want to follow in the pathway of his character. You want to do what he does. The struggle that goes on in the church is often that we preach a great message, but we don't necessarily live compelling lives. And until God's people begin living a compelling life, the gospel will not have the impact in any jurisdiction, in any location, that it is meant to. To have. We can sing God's praises, we can honor His name, but until we start living the compelling life that He has called us to live, there will be no powerful difference because He is a unique God, continually speaking His blessing over our lives, then He's called us to be unique. Let me lead us, please, in a closing word of prayer. Father, I pray that your glory and greatness will be seen by your people. I pray that your people will begin to understand the uniqueness that is found in you and that it will become the compelling reason for them to live a life of obedience and faithfulness to you. I thank you for the great privilege of pastoring a church of people who are following hard after you, who love you, who are seeking your face, who are submitting their lives to the examination and the searchlight of your word and the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that this coming year will be our greatest year of spiritual blessing because we become the compelling people that you have called us to be. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.